mostly on a mythic basis that most Americans know actually very little about how the American West was settled. But through Hollywood, through fictions, through a set of stories, it's come to incarnate what it means to be an American. And so these kinds of things as metaphor constantly exist. So it still has a great deal to do. And you can, you can see it in American politics. I mean, American politics and, and American foreign policy are full of Western metaphors. And I think you have to take those metaphors seriously. What history is, is ultimately very, very complicated. And um, in the end, it never imparts clear lessons. What you do when you turn it into myth, you turn it into a simple story. And the lesson is always the same, and it's always quite clear. So it's, it's relatively easy to operate off of myth. And by myth, I don't mean just false. I mean, it's a way of telling people who they are. And so myth very often, I think, informs American policy and American sense of themselves far more than the actual history. The Obama policy was to go forward, and I, I'm actually an Obama supporter, but the policy in one of his early speeches was to use the Transcontinental Railroad as an example of how it is that, in fact, you have to forge ahead um, to spend government money on projects which don't look likely, and if they had hung back, what would have happened? Well, in this case, if they'd hung back, it probably would have been best for the country. I mean, the, the transcontinental investments, the way they turned out, were disastrous. They were full of fraud. It was exactly the metaphor you don't want to use. But as a metaphor, it doesn't matter what happened to the real transcontinentals. This stands for American ingenuity. This stands for American initiative. This stands for Americans' ability to go ahead against all odds. And that's the way he was using it. And I doubt if he knows anything about the transcontinental Railroads. A couple of things have happened, which probably have parallels with Australia. Is first of all, um, many Native American groups, many American Indian groups, um, now have real political power, both because they have money to spend in political elections and because treaty rights have been sustained. Secondly, they've taken much more control of the actual history, so that the older history in which the continent was either empty or Indian peoples existed simply to resist expansion, that has largely gone away. And I'd say over the last 20 or 30 years, when I teach students, for example, most of the people in the class are far more sympathetic to Indian peoples than they are to um, non-Indians who are taking over the land. And that, that wouldn't have been true 30 or 40 years ago. So these things do change over time. My major argument in the book is what Disney does, is Disney manages to be environmental in, in ways that seem very, very modern and politically conservative at the same time, that the world has to be the way it is. So it's, a, it's an argument um, that's based largely on going through the notes as Disney makes films. One of the things I learned is you cannot overinterpret a Disney film. There's no mystery why penguins suddenly became hot in the 1990s, or early 2000s, especially emperor penguins. Here you have the perfect modern family. The, the father and the mother both raise children. Um, they sacrifice for the child. They have a romantic relationship as it is in the film. Um, all of this becomes this kind of nuclear family which is balanced, which is very different from the kind of animals, lions, or, um, or deer and Bambi, which symbolized other human values. Um, you go back through the Cold War, you can find the same kind of thing. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous, but you can do this through the films. In the Cold War, um, Russians were bees and Americans were dolphins. Um, and you go through nature films, and that's the way that they, they work. So these are not as innocent films as they seem to be. And they're very, very effective.